so welcome everyone to this virtual event of uh, Center for European Policy Analysis and Institute of Modern Russia. Um, I apologize for this technical difficulty in the beginning. My name is Olga Kvostunova. I'm IMR's director and I will be moderating this discussion. Uh, today, IMR launched uh, its new report titled Russia under Putin, 20 years of battling over civil society. And it's now available on IMR's website. So you can go there after this discussion, download it, read it and let us know what you think. And so it's the Russian civil society that we will be discussing today. Um, I just want to quickly add that this is the second report in the series that IMR is uh, working on. And um, the first one was on the protest movement, was released earlier this year. The project uh, is called Russia under Putin, and it was launched to mark Putin's 20 years in power. And we use this date, this uh, 20 years, as a milestone, as a uh, and a starting point to study certain long-term trends in the Russian society and specifically protest movement, which I mentioned, civil society organizations, which we will be discussing today and independent media. And this is something we're currently working on. Um, the reason we do that is because lots of Russian coverage is focused specifically on Putin, his political system. And we just wanted to go beyond that and show a more complex, more nuanced picture of Russia and many key trends in the country, such as corruption, repressions, uh, lack of rule of law, human rights violations. Um, they're well known, but uh, often not as well understood. And they're often looked at as isolated incidents and sometimes the patterns are missing from the coverage and from the discussions. Uh, and there are also some assumptions about Putin's system being powerful, monolithic, and that the civil society is weak, passive, obedient. And I think we want to challenge this assumptions a little bit. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have a great panel today. Um, I have um, Jana Gorokovska. Uh, who is civil society researcher and she contributed to this project. Uh, we also have Miriam Lanskoy, who is senior director for Russia and Eurasia at National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, Edward Lucas, a senior fellow for SEPA, Center for European Policy Analysis. And Denis Volkov, deputy director of Levada Center, Russia's independent polling organization. Um, and I'm happy to have you all here. And let me start uh, with uh, Jana. So because you worked on this project, um, can you talk a little bit about the report? Uh, what do you see as the key trends in Russian civil society? And what is new that this report is telling us? Great, thank you, Lydia. So I'm gonna go through the report. Uh, let me just get this on the screen. One second. Okay, is everyone seeing it? Yes. Okay, so the report, as Orda said, Russia under Putin, 20 years of battling over civil society. Uh, the, re the report uses interviews with experts and practitioners working in Russian civil society. It also uses uh, information from a sample of organizations currently working in five Russian regions. That's an original, uh, original information, new data, um, as well as reports put out by both international and Russian organizations on the state of civil society and peer reviewed research. Now the report only focuses on civil, formal civil society organizations, which I think uh, most people will understand it does not encompass all of civil society. 
uh, in Russia. Nevertheless, this is a sector that's received a lot of funding over the years, uh, both international and domestic. It's also been the target of a lot of regulation more recently, um, and it tends to receive uh, quite a, a lot of media attention. So this is a sector that is often discussed, but maybe not so well understood. And the main story that the report tells is one of increasing government control over the sector and also resiliency that's been shown by organizations. And so just to start, this is an idea of uh, how many civil society organizations there are in Russia. You can see a steep decline um, over the course of the last 15 years. Right now, there is slightly over um, 200,000 organizations uh, registered with the Ministry of Justice. Um, and that's been holding, holding steady uh, over the last seven years. Um, the problem with these numbers, as I think most people who work on this topic will, uh, will know, is that this is all nonprofits, so called nonprofits working in Russia, which uh, in Russia encompasses. Um, groups like political parties, real estate associations, even um, government run corporations. These are all nonprofits according to Russian law, according to the civil code. And so they all fall under uh, into this registry. And this makes it very difficult for us to tell what the actual state of the sector uh, is. Um, and so a number of experts uh, quoted in the report say that um, tracking the development of the sector is incredibly difficult. Uh, even knowing uh, basic facts about its size uh, is difficult. And this is also something that is confirmed by reports from Russia's own um, federal uh, public chamber on civil society. As I said, the report also relies on a sample of organizations currently working in five Russian regions. Um, and from those organizations, we know that about 46% work on social welfare issues like children, the youth, veterans, the elderly, um, disability rights, culture. The organizations are surprisingly durable. Over half are 10 years or older. Uh, and over half are run by women. So it's an, also an interesting fact about the sector. This gives you an idea of um, what the sector, at least on paper, uh, looks like compared to other post-communist states. Um, only about 10 to 15 percent of the registered organizations actually function, but this is something that is also true for other uh, countries like Ukraine and Georgia. And of course, uh, this is nowhere near the size of the sector of the nonprofit or NGO sector in the U.S., which has 1.5 million registered NGOs currently. So as I said, the story is largely one of increasing control, um, mostly motivated by a fear of outside influences on society um, that the Kremlin has, and that was sparked or at least fueled by the color revolutions in the mid 2000s where uh, international uh, civil society organizations were sort of instrumental in protest movements that eventually led to regime change. And then of course, Russia experienced its own, its own massive um, uh, electoral fraud uh, protests in 2011 and 2012, um, which further um, stoked this suspicion of outside influences. And so using regulation, funding and closer integration with state agencies over the last 20 years, but more, uh, more rapidly over the last 10 years, the state has really tried to increase its control over the sector. Uh, some of the, I think, more well-known regulations and laws are the foreign agent law and the undesirable organizations law, which have uh, really made the work of some organizations um, difficult. Uh, but there's also just been an increase in overall uh, regulation. So, for instance, the main law in Russia on uh, nonprofits has been changed a total of 90 times. Um, and most of those changes have been have happened in the last in the course of the last 15 years. 
The result of these strategies has been the division of civil society between so-called good organizations. These are organizations that work on non-political issues and cooperate with the state, and they have, they have received increased funding and state resources and bad organizations. These are organizations that work on political issues and often find themselves in conflict with the state. Uh, and these organizations have been marginalized and in some cases criminalized. But civil society is not without its own agency. And as the report makes clear, there have been strategies that have been adopted by groups to respond. I think there is a striking quote in the report from one of the experts that was consulted where um, vulnerability and adaptability go hand in glove for the sector, which has always faced uh, a difficult environment in Russia. And so for the um, targeted civil society organizations, uh, strategies to deal um, with their changing situation is increased informality. So some groups just disband and work as informal associations, creating new clean organizations, uh, just basically restarting um, and operating the same way, partnering with for-profit organizations so that they can hold on to funding, moving abroad, or changing their organizational tactics. These are all strategies that have been adopted. And I think the reality is that the legal environment has, um, has not prevented most organizations from functioning. Now, uh, with regard to the social welfare organizations that work in partnership with the state, these are sometimes dismissed as not part of civil society, but what the report also makes clear is that these organizations perform not only really valuable services for sometimes underrepresented communities, but they also uh, perform functions that we would typically think civil society is responsible for, such as consciousness raising around issues or even advocacy. And they do this because they have access to state agencies where they can advance uh, certain ideas and even have an impact on improving policy. And this has been especially important in areas like disability rights, elder, elder care, um, and HIV AIDS. So the report also ends with five recommendations based, um, based on the substance. Um, and these recommendations are that the definition of civil society that's applied to Russia uh, is uh, often too narrow and focuses too much on the political with, uh, at the exclusion of groups that work on social welfare issues that are also important. And with regard to these groups, what's important to them is that they are in an unequal relationship with the state where they are often perceived to be a junior partner and just a helper. And what helps them um, to elevate themselves in that relationship is to be perceived as experts. And they can gain that expertise, as we found out through interviews um, and through other research, they can gain that expertise by participating in international forums, workshops, and things like that, which is something that, um, that can, those opportunities can be provided to them, especially um, now where sort of everything is more digital. Civil society organizations also take many forms, uh, including just being informal. And this is something that funders should consider um, when, out, when making uh, their funding guidelines. And Russian civil society organizations are the best arbiters of their own legal situation. And uh, we should trust their judgment and their agency. And finally, um, everyone working in this sector would benefit from having access to more uh, and clear um, data on what the sector actually looks like. Um, because right now it's very, very difficult to get an overall picture of the size and the scope of the sector, not only how many organizations there are, but what portion of the Russian population works in this sector, how many people use the resources of this sector, what kind of tax liability this sector has. This is all information that um, we would benefit from having. So I'll stop there. And I think I should be back now, right? Voila. Yes, thank you, Jana. Uh, well, that's basically the gist of the report. So I want to go straight to Den to Denise. It's a Russian way of saying to Dennis. Um, so 
Dennis, you uh, are in a unique position. You're based in Russia. Um, you're also a sociologist, so you observe certain trends. And I've seen recent um, service on Levada where uh, among the institutions that Russian trusts the most, I think charity organizations were ranked as number four, which I found really interesting. So I wanted to ask you about that. Do you see any changes in the public attitudes towards um, civil society organizations, nonprofits, uh, charity organizations? That's uh, part one of the question. But you also work for the organization that has actually been labeled as foreign agent. So I wanted to ask uh, about your experience, how your organization um, tried to deal with this designation. Uh, hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to say that uh, this uh, is a, a good report. Uh, a balanced one uh, that presents, uh, try to present the picture not only in black uh, colors, but also try to uh, make it more nuanced and balanced. And uh, I think it uh, uh, captures this very interesting, uh, uh, this two controversial trends in uh, uh, Russian civil society as I uh, see it. One is uh, obvious that there is a mounting pressure on uh, civil society, first of all, of course, on organized civil society. Uh, and it's easier to do so, yes, to uh, pressure the existing uh, NGOs and organizations, not only NGOs, but free media uh, uh, and all these, uh, ad uh, all these groups that try to uh, make uh, government, different branches of government uh, accountable. And uh, these are, uh, first of all, under, under pressure, media, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, monitors, uh, electoral monitors, for example, uh, advocacy groups. And uh, for, for this uh, part of civil society, it is, uh, the life is uh, well, not easy, I would uh, uh, put it this way. And uh, those who were labeled uh, 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 foreign agents, uh, there are again very big diversity here of the responses and uh, the report is dealing with this. Uh, some as our organizations try to uh, go on with their work, others just were closed down because they do not have, didn't have uh, enough money to uh, pay uh, fines. It's about 5,000, 5,000 I think uh, dollars, uh, a regular fine for not registering as a, um, a, a, a foreign agent. So a uh, big range. Others move to uh, to operate outside of outside of Russia, but you just can uh, look in the report to look uh, look at this. But at the same time, the same time with uh, obviously negative. Uh, trend in uh, uh, civil society with this pressure. There is a positive one uh, that uh, uh, civil society seems uh, seems to be uh, more vibrant, and uh, uh, and with uh, sometimes we see uh, on the um, even more frequent now that government have to uh, yield to pressure for this bottom bottom up pr pressure in different. Uh, well, for small protests when people go out and try to uh, uh, voice their uh, uh, discontent or try to ask something from the from the state, and uh, uh, we see in Ekaterinburg, in uh, Bashkortostan, that people actually sometimes get uh, uh, what they want if it is not connected with, uh, I would say. Um, execution of authorities, when it's not about the elections for, uh, uh, as in Moscow last year, or when it is not about uh, releasing the, uh, 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 the governor who was uh, put in custody like in uh, Khabarov. So still there is uh, uh, um, room for civil society to get what uh, 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 people want. So I think this, uh, this report captures this trend on a, a smaller scale of uh, uh, NGO sector, but I think it's uh, this this du duality, if I may so uh, say so. I think is the uh, the main feature of 
uh, civil society in Russia right now. Um, Miriam, I'll go to you. Um, and I just looked at one of the questions that I think you will be interested in talking about. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your perspective being in the US and working with civil society organizations. Um, what do you see as the key trends? You know, like Dennis said, there is the duality and the trends that Jana also mentioned. Do you see anything that um, confirms the fact that Russian civil society is resilient and um, manages to preserve its agency and vibrancy? Um, and how does it fight against the restrictions and how does it basically manages to remain as it is um, working and surviving all this authoritarian trends? And also here, this is the, one of the questions, uh, do you see anything new in, um, in the Russian youth? Do you see any uh, vibrance and agency there? Do you see young people organizing and also you know, trying to maintain the strand of civil society in Russia? Sorry, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> thank you, Olga, uh, for having me. And uh, thank you for convening and for uh, uh, Jana's excellent uh, report. And it's tough to follow Denise because he, he has articulated it um, uh, sort of beautifully, uh, the, two, the two trends. So what we can see over the, the last 20 years is absolutely a tightening of all kinds of um, regulations. And of course, you know, the report focuses on the regulatory space. But in addition to that, we know very well, there's all kinds of repression. And, you know, there's hundreds of political prisoners, there's, um, you know, killings, poisonings, uh, um, threats to take children away from activists. Uh, we know several instances, including, for instance, Masha Gessen, who was very public about this. Um, uh, there's, in addition to the tightening of the legal space for registered NGOs, uh, there's also a lot, a lot of repression going on. Um, at the same time, it hasn't really been successful uh, at the, the, what, what is the, the goal? The goal is to isolate the portion of society that is opposition-minded, um, that is interested in um, not just politics in terms of political competition, but the whole idea of accountability of the state, is to isolate that portion from the public and to label them as bad, label them as foreign agents, uh, CIA stooges, whatever, and make sure that they can't really interact with broader segments of Russian population. So that has failed. Um, and what's really interesting about the report and about what's going on in Russia right now um, is if you look at the regions, uh, it, what we're seeing in Khabarovsk uh, continuous, it's hundreds of days of protest. But we saw it already in Yekaterinburg, we saw it in Shays, uh, we saw all kinds of um, grassroots uh, protests over very specific local issues. Um, there's remarkable vitality and a remarkable level of organization going on in Russian civil society and opposition movements. So I found the emphasis on the regions to be really interesting and I'd love it if IMR um, sort of followed up with a more in-depth look at, and you identified these regions because they had um, greater concentration of civil society organizations, but also um, instances of protest activity. So it would just be interesting to get more depth into these, um, into these factors. Um, the relationship with the state is also really interesting. So the state wants to say that there's some kind of, um, and, and, and the report captured well the artificiality of these things, that there are the good NGOs that help people, and then there are the bad NGOs that 
you know, uh, pick fights with the state. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's not a, um, that's not a authentic, uh, that, that's a propagandistic division. Um, because as, as you say correctly in the report, the people who are, who are, who see, a, who have a social mandate, they, they have their own agencies and they approach the state from the perspective of their own agency. They're not just tools. There might be some that are gongos that are tools of the state, but that's not fair to say about the whole sector. They do believe in what they're doing. They, um, there was a really interesting study of the Yekaterinburg activist that was based on interviews with, we saw a protest movement uh, last summer and the activists there all said, we want to work with the state. And, and, and the way the study characterized it is that this new protest movement is not anti-state. It wants the state to work for them. It wants to get the local officials to be responsive, which is very different. It's a very different kind of mindset. Um, and it's very, it's very positive, it's proactive. So I think the, the focus on the regions, the interest, um, uh, uh, in local activism around local issues is super interesting. And I'm, I'm really glad um, that you focused on this. Um, and let me just, just throw out a couple of other examples that are kind of outside the scope of the report, but I think point to, to similar tendencies to this um, vitality of civil society, if it's kind of understood more broadly. Um, I would say Navalny's movement um, and Often we focus on the figure of Navalny, but that figure is, you know, 80 plus regional offices, young people throughout the country continuing to work. Um, and whether he's in prison or whether he's been poisoned is in the hospital, they're producing reports. They're, you know, they're carrying out all of this work. He has managed to build, or his team, we should say, that there's a collective leadership and what we don't talk about enough is how over a period of 20 years, uh, Febeka has, has created this whole network and there's, there's YouTube, there's a trade union, there's the party, there's, and all of it tries to be in the official space. They're squeezed out of the official space, but they try, they keep trying to register in one capacity or another and they're being pushed out of it, yet they remain a really important factor. And how the repression plays is not always so straightforward. After being poisoned and almost killed, his rating, Navalny, is, he has greater recognition and greater trust today than he did before he was poisoned. So by squeezing people into the informal space, you haven't necessarily um, um, isolated them from the society more broadly. Um, and then just to give another example is the media space um, where, uh, uh, again, uh, YouTube is remarkable. Um, and the, the sort of the best of the YouTubers out there and somebody like Yuri Dude attract millions of viewers when you produce a quality, really good, the, the, the film on Kalima, the film on HIV, the film on Beslan. When you, when a charismatic, you know, thoughtful journalist, when you have top of the line product, and it goes out on YouTube, you can compete with state media and you can compete especially among young and urban audiences. Um, this is huge, this is huge. This is a different world from a world 20 years ago. Russia could not successfully block Telegram. Um, this means that Russia is not about to block YouTube. So this whole um, space, and Russians watch YouTube's, YouTube for hours. So there's a whole burgeoning um, uh, society out there that is free thinking and that is interested in all kinds of um, themes that are, that are very painful for the state, that the state doesn't necessarily want them to be, to be thinking about. Um, so anyway, so I do see um, a lot of vibrancy and a lot of uh, very, very interesting trends in Russian civil society. I'm very grateful to you for the report and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that these are very valuable comments, basically capturing what 
we were trying to say with data, you say with experience. Um, and I, I'm very glad that you pointed out that all these attempts by the Russian state to squash uh, anything of value in put everyone in line, it just doesn't work because in Russia is it doesn't work, you know, basically in life you can uh, push someone, but there is always going to be a counter push at some point, you know, on some level. Um, so I want to go to Edward and um, sort of try to tap his expertise. You've been writing about Russia for many decades. Uh, so uh, judging from the Western perspective, what do you think is missing in terms of how the West sees Russia and what's missing in terms of Western policies towards Russia? Does the West see this complexity in the Russian society? Well, thanks very much, uh, Alia, and almost everything I had on my list of points to make has been made <laughs> either by um, uh, uh, Dennis or by um, Miriam. Um, so I think that, I mean, the first thing is that this is a very important uh, corrective to the simplistic Western idea that um, Russia is just a dictatorship and if you stand up against the regime you get um, murdered or there's an attempted murder and that is true at the, what one might call the sort of the very sharp end and I just wanted to mention Yuri Dmitriev because uh, that's a kind of example of the appalling kind of pressure that can be put on you um, if you really get under the um, Kremlin's skin. Um, it's not just attacks on you, but you know, separation from, from, from loved ones and so on. But that is only part of the of the universe. And I think that this, this sort of wide range of, of activity, which is, even if it's on things that the Kremlin basically thinks are a good idea, um, they're always bumping up against the failures of governments, the failures to provide public service and infrastructure and other um, functions of the state, which are very characteristic of, of Putin's Russia and which his sort of narrative of modernization doesn't, you know, it just, just doesn't fit, fit, fit with the facts. And, and that's tremendously important. And Miriam was talking about a, a system. I think it's a kind of an ecosystem. You have a whole slice of life in which people are used to uh, consuming information freely, producing information freely, getting together with other people to try and make things happen. And even if it's on a, a very micro and seemingly quote, a political level, um, it's still, it's incomparable um, compared to what, you know, for example, what happens in China. Um, this is, you know, Russia is far, far freer than China in this respect. And th this, this sort of civic society ecosystem, whether it's formal or informal, controversial or less controversial, large scale or small scale, it's the sort of the, the subsoil for uh, democratic, agitation and, and, and protest. It's really hard for the Kremlin to crack down on this and they may go after intimidated individuals that they can't sort of kill this whole e ecosystem. And, and it, in the long run, it's, it's, um, it is dangerous to them. In terms of what the West should do, um, first of all, accept the breadth of the, um, of, of this sort of this ecosystem and while campaigning very hard, we could do a lot more of the sort of Navalny and Dmitriev. And I think the idea of engaging with even the sort of you know, semi-state sponsored organizations um, is, st is, still a good, is, is still a good one. Keeping the funding going, not being intimidated by the foreign agent registration um, rules and, and uh, other difficulties. And I think perhaps most of all, not to be pessimistic. This is actually a really encouraging report. And I'm just thinking back to when I was based in Moscow 20 years ago um, and how pleased I would have been if someone had produced this report then and said, this is what's happening in, in Russia right now. I would have read past all the um, bureaucratic and other difficulties. And I would have just been um, delighted at the sort of the, the, the depth and breadth of um, what we um, think we're seeing. Uh, one, one thing I'd love to know for sort of future research would be more of a deep dive on a particular region. It was very interesting seeing that you mentioned the Hantimansi and Novgorod and Khabarovsk and Samara and Penza. Um, I think it'd be really 
interesting to do some more qualitative research based on what either one of those five or somewhere else and look at um, the uh, you know, get get behind get behind the scene the, the, behind the scenes a bit and that might compensate for some of the shortcomings we have in trying to do quantitative research where the statistics are so often in Russia um, don't really give you the full picture of what's going on. But I'm aware that we are rather over time for our initial segment and there's lots of people watching who want to ask questions. So I will stop there and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Yes, I think it's time for us to take some of the audience questions. Um, there's been many very interesting ones. So I'm just trying to um, maybe uh, rephrase them. So um, one of the questions touched upon the differences in the civil society. Maybe Jana can try and um, answer it. So um, if the civil society is strong, are there any different trends within it? You know, do you see groups that support the, what this person is saying, predatory Russian state, um, as opposed to other groups that I guess are more liberal and more democratic? Um, so I think it's important, as Edward was just saying, uh, to recognize the diversity of the civil society space in Russia. So uh, people, you know, the, the point of civil society groups is for people to organize independently on a voluntary basis to pursue um, topics uh, or goals that concern them. And so the nature of those goals, I think we would uh, sort of in an idealized way think that, you know, it's, it's that these are always going to be um, strongly liberal, strongly democratic kind of goals, but sometimes civil society are just groups that, that of people who share certain interests. And so they can pursue different goals. And I think that that's entirely fine and is in fact healthy that people have um, these groups to go to. Um, it, what I think is interesting in the, the and again, that mirrors um, sort of Western civil society in Russia is that groups pop up in response to problems that civil society itself faces. Um, and I think a really good example of that is the organization over the info, which is an organization that provides legal advice um, and monitors arrests at protests. And it was an organization that was founded sort of as a grassroots movement during the 2011, 2012 massive protests that took place in Russia after the uh, fraudulent Duma elections. And the organization has really grown from that point where now they are really effective at helping people when they um, are detained or arrested at protests. And we saw this last summer in Moscow where they had a chat bot that was giving people advice. They had a 24 hour hotline where you could call. They organized people, um, they organized taxis for people to take home from detention centers. Um, and this is, uh, this is an organization that, that sprang up to solve a very particular problem that other civil society um, agents were facing. Uh, and I think Russia is full of those sorts of examples. Um, it's sort of, and yeah, just to go back to sort of the diversity of the sector. Um, I just want to add a few words about the predatory Russian state. So we see, and it is in the report, we see uh, a number of organizations that work closely with the Russian state, veteran organizations, military organizations, uh, trade unions, um, it is not really clear from the data whether they are toxic or not. Um, and I think it comes down to specific people. So we cannot identify it as a trend. Uh, some of these organizations use the connection to the Russian state as a survival line, as a line of getting funding. It doesn't mean that these are uh, predatory organizations who want to invade Ukraine. On the other hand, I'm sure there are some toxic groups in Russia as there are in any other society. So uh, just pointing it out. Um, I think there, are, there is a couple of questions that uh, people want to know about uh, informal civil society and using informal networks as a, um, as a way to connect so if anyone wants to discuss that, um, 
please. Anyone? Maybe Dennis or Jana? Okay. Uh, well, if we look at uh, well, NGOs and uh, people working in NGOs, we are speaking about, I think, uh, three, four percent of population. Of course, there are more people who uh, can benefit from uh, uh, NGOs, but uh, quite often uh, we in our surveys, in our uh, focus groups, uh, see that uh, people not always understand that these are NGOs who provide the services. And quite often the general impression is that it's, it's the state. Who else could uh, have provide uh, free, uh, free assistance? Only the state and no one else. Uh, but if we look, uh, if we talk about um, um, all kind of associations, people working together uh, to well to solve some problem and so on, I would say we can speak about one third of uh, uh, Russian society who are regularly involved in uh, uh, different kind of activities together. And actually, this uh, uh, this figure is rather stable over years. But what we see that maybe the quality of the, um, um, these associations, the thickness of the um, uh, connections between people in uh, in big uh, big cities, but not only in big cities, it's it's uh, so it's uh, uh, more. Uh, more strong now that people have more experience and those who want to do something uh, they can they already know how to uh, find information where uh, where to go whom to turn to so this this experience i think uh, make this uh, uh, difference of, of uh, this broader uh, civil society and maybe one only thing i will add and uh, uh, I want to say that uh, interestingly, what we see in our surveys that uh, uh, despite of any uh, political views and uh, sympathy, political sympathies, attitudes towards the authorities even, uh, uh, people now, uh, or many people, majority of people now believe that uh, people have right to ask and to demand from the state uh, uh, to solve uh, the problems that they uh, uh, that they have, so uh, it doesn't uh, mm, uh, differ between whether it is uh, Putin supporters or uh, Navalny supporters. Uh, people say uh, say that they have the right, and uh, that the state has to uh, be functional, and uh, there is also growing um, dissatisfaction of bureaucracy. So. People now are more readily ask for uh, for not even assistance, but demand uh, for what they uh, think they have the right to, and I think this is uh, an important uh, trend. Thank you, Dennis, Miriam. I want to uh, give you a question about the Russian youth. Do you see? Uh, any specific society, civil society engagement by young people in Russia? And uh, yeah, let's stop there. Uh, sure, I think we are seeing uh, more young people um, engaged in civil society. There used to be a kind of Oh, a stereotype of sort of the dissident movement and you know being being dominated by older figures with a kind of heroic um, Soviet past, um, and that's just not you know you do uh, as the report shows there's um, increasingly women, um, but also young people, and there is a new you know I, I again it's it's uh, <laughs> it's intimidating to have Denise here because he'll he can uh, he has all the data on different. Uh, 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 population segments. But look, we do see um, uh, correlations between uh, being young, not remembering, you know, not the, the repression, the memory of repression being a little bit further away, being a, a post-Soviet generation um, and uh, consuming independent news and having more um, democratic attitudes. And it's, there's, um, uh, a kind of, um, I'm forgetting who the sociologist was, but they divided Russia into five different 
areas and uh, the ur urban middle class, young, more well-to-do, more educated has been kind of in a, in a different and freer intellectual state um, for, for, for a long time, for how the, the, the reason the legislation became as bad as it did is that you saw, she defined it as Russia one and Russia two. So Russia one is really the urban, uh, the world-class cities, Moscow, St. Petersburg, those left United Russia uh, 10 years ago. Um, now, increasingly, more and more younger people um, through, throughout the regions are sort of joining those trends. And um, I think we're seeing, it, we're seeing it pop up in some surprising circumstances. Um, and, and it's making, uh, you know, and whether we see them in the media um, viewership tendencies or we see them out, out in the streets, or we see them in volunteerism in some kind of local, um, uh, local initiatives. Um, we, it's, it's, it's a different, um, it's an, it's a kind of approach of trying to achieve, uh, achieve something yourself. And that's uh, very positive. Well, yeah, if I can just add a little bit here, sure. it's, uh, you know, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit less, the state made a concerted effort to um, capture sort of the youth movement, right? With the Nashi uh, youth movement that was very much pro-Kremlin, very, very nationalistic. Um, and at, and it, at its high point in the late 2000s had a huge membership and was actually uh, sort of for the people involved in it was an effective organization. Um, but we haven't seen anything. I mean, that disappeared and we haven't seen anything like that since. And I think subsequently you've seen young people um, not captured by a state kind of movement move, move into more of the sort of activist space. And we saw last summer, um, you know, the students in Moscow who rallied around other students who had been arrested at protests and were actually, you know, acting like a block, uh, like an interest group. Um, uh, as an identifiable segment of society. And so I think, you know, the, the state is not paying as much attention um, to the youth as it maybe it did, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, we still have eight questions unanswered. So I'm gonna try to, um, and we have 10 minutes left. Um, um, so there is a question about the toxicity of U.S. funding for Russian NGOs, uh, as opposed to say European funding. Can anyone take that question? It's a difficult one, but I think it's interesting. It has a political flavor. I, I can. I mean I, I mean, I can start. Maybe. Sorry, Miriam. I'll just say a, a quick sentence about this. I think the um, there was work in the 90, you know, the problem in the 19, 1990s, as we kind of evaluate it now, is that there was a lot of foreign funding, but it um, it motivated civil society to be sort of, you know, working for grants and not necessarily working for the interests of Russian citizens. Uh, and so it professionalized civil society in a very specific way, which was maybe not um, in service of the Russian population. And the lack of foreign funding now um, is definitely not a positive thing, but what we do see is an explosion of crowdfunding, crowdsourcing crowdfunding. Um, you know, I think it's not uh, true that Russians are not involved in charitable giving. They are, and their kind of direct charitable giving is considerable. And just the ease of doing it via phones and via apps and things like that. Um, or, and organizations are really taking sort of advantage of that new structure. Miriam, do you wanna sure. add a few words to this? Sure, I would, um, I'd say a couple of things. So yes, of course, there's, there's tremendous scrutiny um, on organizations that receive foreign funds. And it's probably even more so uh, for American organizations um, uh, than, than, um, than European ones. Although at this point, 
you know, there are several, Med was the first undesirable donor, but at this point there are several European organizations on there as well. So I'm not sure, it, it depends on the political context and it, it's something that um, when there's other tensions in the relationship, there's greater um, propaganda around this theme. It's a propagandistic theme and it's sort of, it's, it's hit or miss. Somebody could be receiving foreign funding for a long time without it becoming a big problem, but then the political climate heats up for whatever reason and, and, and an organization might become very vulnerable. Um, so there's, there's tremendous reporting requirements. There's a lot of scrutiny. There's a lot of that kind of um, uh, difficulty, difficult life. Um, but, um, but at the same time, like what we have to keep in mind is that people are making choice about the work that they do. And this is often a, like something that's very central to their identity and how they perceive themselves and they want to do this work. And if you look at repression in terms of who's going to jail, who's getting beaten up, poisoned, whatever, it is always about activity as opposed to about funding. There's no one in jail for receiving foreign funds. Um, it's always about questioning the state in one form or another. And, you know, um, prisoners stemming from uh, the Moscow protests last year, or from, you know, if you, if you take a look at who the political prisoners are, it's not about foreign funding, it's about uh, protest. It's about, um, you know, or religious belief. What, Memori Memorial has a list of, I think, almost 200 prisoners who are freedom of conscience uh, cases. So it, it kind of cuts both ways. So yes, the there's, I, I would say, highly propagandistic use of this whole theme of uh, foreign donors, uh, but at the same time, repression that can be quite harsh and completely unrelated to, to, that, to that topic. Um, I want to address one question to Edward. So you've been writing about Russia and broader post-Soviet space. So there is a question here about the strength of Russian civil society as opposed to Central and Eastern Europe, but let's put it in the context of post-Soviet space in general. Is it strong, stronger, weaker? What do you think? Well, I think the, the numbers you show, um, if one did that as a relative to population, it would show that Russian civil society is quite underdeveloped, um, the uh, you know, country like Poland, which is sort of uh, you know, 39 million people. Um, and I think we've had about two thirds number of uh, registered um, NGOs. So, but I, I also think one, one has to be very careful about, as, as you said, said earlier, about taking the, um, these sort of headline numbers as being particularly indicative. I suppose the thing that, that does strike me very much is, is the comparison with Belarus and the way in which Belarus, which is in some ways probably the country closest to, um, to, to, to Russia in demographic and cultural um, terms, has shown this explosion of, of opposition and um, of civil society activity. And I'm I was very encouraged and interested to see protesters in Habarovsk waving Belarusian flags. I'd love to know how they got them. And I was also pleased to see um, protesters in, in Belarus saying, Habarovsk, uh, Ms. Vami, we're, we're with you. Um, so I think that there's, uh, in, in, but pe perhaps that the, whereas Maidan was seen as um, not terribly attractive by many people in, in Russia for, for various reasons. Um, the example of Belarus may be, may, may be quite, quite a powerful one. And um, so I think that's, that's something to watch. Um, I also noticed the um, anti-abortion protesters in, in Poland who are in enormous numbers. This is the biggest, so the, the, the anti-abortion crackdown, the, the pro-choice um, protesters in Poland, um, which I think is the biggest um, 
public demonstration we've seen anywhere in Central Europe since the collapse of communism. Um, I noticed they were, were in, as well as chanting things, um, denouncing their government for this very tough new um, right to life law. Uh, they were also chanting Belarus, Belarus. So I, I, I think the, the, it's, it's well worth studying how much, um, you know, how these um, both organizational structures and ideas um, percolate across, across borders. With one minute to go, what are the most urgent needs of the Russian civil society organizations? Can anyone throw a few words? Yana, maybe you to wrap it up. Yeah, I mean, I think funding, um, definitely there was a, a study recently out um, that was actually done um, by uh, the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Um, funding is still the number one concern for civil society organizations. Um, one of the problems is that state funding has increased, but often it is um, sort of project-based. And so that means that the operational costs of an organization year to year are not covered and they have to figure out a way of, of managing that. Um, and there's also just a lot of strings attached. And um, because the pot of money is much smaller than it used to be, there's increased competition. So funding is still the number one need for civil society organizations. Um, and uh, I think probably the second need is um, public uh, support, which I think um, you know, public opinion data shows that is increasing recently. Um, so on this note, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to take more questions. There are some questions about the report methodology. You can find it inside the report and, uh, and it, it explains the decline of the number of NGOs over time and why we uh, chose the regions we chose. Uh, as for other questions, uh, you can find us all on Twitter and we are more than happy to discuss it. Um, so I thank you all again, and I thank all the panelists for their insightful comments, and I thank SEPA for hosting this event, um, and I hope we can discuss the Russian civil society more in more detail. So thank you.